Oh Lord, we thank you for your word to us. It's a light for our path. It is food for our soul. May it be so for us this morning. Amen and amen. Well, we're well and truly into our roaming through Romans journey um, as we come to this week. And one of the things that has struck me uh, as we, since we started uh, this Lent journey is how easy it is uh, to talk about Christian belief in very cerebral or abstract terms. There are books and blog posts and articles and commentaries and all manner of highfalutin theological nuances to get into. But what's that got to do with real life? And we, <laughs> we have this tendency to, to be abstract about these things and to push back. And we need to um, challenge ourselves. Because, you see, for most of the Christian world, it's not like that. Uh, for most of our brothers and sisters, the gospel that Paul speaks of isn't just some nice theory. It's uh, the real, factual essence of their life. Jesus is not some historical curiosity. He is a present reality without whom we are undone and bereft of foundation, identity and purpose. You see, for, for much of the Christian world, salvation is not just a matter of eternal destination, but a necessary hope for this day, for this moment. Because for most of the Christian world, who knows what this day is? may bring but we know we trust in the lord we live in this moment with him in this moment in this place wherever we might be right now and we are offering to him our voice our hands we live the life of freedom he brings here and now and of course we understand that we have a freedom in christ and we really understand it when we remember what spiritual captivity might look like. Jesus isn't abstract in our experience when we understand the power of sin. When we have experienced and know what it's like for us to be broken ourselves and to live out of our brokenness, then we understand how real and present the freedom of Jesus is. Or when, if we have uh, someone who is receiving oppression or persecution, and that is our captivity, then the experience of Jesus is of someone who is concretely, physically, emotionally, spiritually, right now and eternally setting us free. But if I'm honest, it's not easy for me, and it's not easy for most of us, to grasp that reality. I was really convicted this week when I heard a reflection in a podcast and it pushed back at the value we place on our academic, liberal, abstract interpretations of the Bible. What this podcast was saying, it was asserting that such a way of handling the word of God spoke more of our comfort and our white middle class privilege than the gospel that speaks mostly of the freeing of the oppressed. And the voice is a brown-skinned Middle Eastern voice of an ancient people that we try to appropriate for our own comfortable ends. It was a really strong word that pricked at my soul. With all the good things we have, we have what we need to hear the word of God and to read his testimonies. We are privileged to have commentaries and many, many English translations and we should savour the opportunity that they afford to seek his face and to sit at his feet and with his followers cry, tell us more, we need it. Instead, we're often comfortable just to take the word of God and make it a literal thought for the day. It was a strong word. So as we come... And as we reflect on where we are at the moment in our road into Romans, what do we see in the light of that conviction? We see here Paul. We see an apostle. We see a friend and a pastor. An unworthy lover of Jesus, in his own words. 
who is also a scholar and an academic, and he is using all the tools he has at his disposal to explain and exhort and demonstrate a reality. His audience aren't people who are just attenders of a church in Rome. They are Christians, Christ's ones, fellow disciples intent on shaping their lives by a new king in their moment, in their place, through their voice, with their hands. Sometimes what Paul does is he tries to predict the sorts of questions and challenges they will face as they do that. Because the way of Christ is not without its opponents. He wants to strengthen them in their moment, in their place, with the use of their voice and their hands. And as we've got to our point here in Romans chapter 6, which Pete read for us, he has already laid out the gospel of a loving, reconciled, reconciling, promise-making, promise-keeping heart of God revealed in Jesus. And he knows that there will be those who will be scandalised by the fact that this Jesus they follow was crucified as a criminal. So in chapter 3, he explains it for them. And he knows that there will be Jews who will be scandalized by how the Gentiles are being included and embraced by this love of God and by the spirit of Jesus himself. And so he has shown us in chapter 4 and other places that the call of faith is grounded in the root of the Jewish family history in Abraham himself. And now in chapter 6, he's predicting another question. There are going to be some that think that his brothers and his sisters in following Jesus are choosing a cheap and shallow way of life. Maybe it will come as an accusation. Ha! If God is going to give you grace no matter what, you could just keep on sinning. What an easy religion you have. Or it may be a manipulation. Well, if God's grace has covered all things, then you must accept me as I am no matter what I do. I can do what I want. And what he's in predicting this question, what he's, what he's seeing is the way in which there will be a twist given to the union-seeking, reconciling love of God. A miscasting of God's inclusive embrace. A grace so cheap that it puts no call on our lives and it puts no desire in our hearts about how we live in this moment, in this place, with our voice and with our hands. And so in this reading, Paul begins to answer that question, to resource them. And once again, what he's going to do, he's going to show us how this good news of Jesus springs up from the ancient roots of salvation history. Both here and into the next few chapters, what he's going to do is interweave his arguments and his themes and his thoughts around one of the most foundational moments in all of the scriptures. The exodus of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. Because for the Jews, God is not some abstract theological truth. He is first and foremost the God of their history. He is the God who saved them. He is the one who heard their cries when they were captive in Egypt. He is the one who remembered his children. He is the one who intervened physically, who defeated an army for the sake of his little ones and drew them out into a promised land of hope and joy, out through the Red Sea and on through the wilderness. And for Paul, this is not abstract or theoretical. Without God, that fact of history, he and his people are still slaves or worse, snuffed out from memory altogether. Perhaps we should be pondering something similar. It's worth thinking about. Without God's intervention in your life, where would you be right now? Without the favour of God, where would this country be right now? How cheaply are we holding on to his grace and his favour? You can see, as we pose those sorts of questions, why Paul might be bringing these Exodus themes into the question he's considering. Because the fact of the matter in that Exodus story, not only is there the freedom and the joy and the rescue of God, there is also a persistent part of the story where the people did hold God's grace cheaply. They were given freedom. They were rescued and redeemed. Their feet were literally on the soil of a different land and their children were no longer being killed or forced into labour and yet they grumbled 
and they complained. And when things got hard, they looked backwards to the comforts of their captivity. And when God's calling and leadership were not as they expected, they turned to idols, to abstractions that they could manage. Thanks for the freedom, God. We'll do it ourselves now. This isn't just abstract theory. For Paul, it's present truth. Many years after the Red Sea and towards the end of his life, Moses speaks to the next generation of God's people in Deuteronomy 5, and he makes it clear to them, it was not with your ancestors that the Lord made a covenant, he says, but with us, with all of us who are alive here today. The Lord has said to you, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Paul hears this story and knows that it's not just with his ancestors that the Lord made a covenant. It was him alive today. And it's why when we open the word of God and receive it on its terms, not melting it down for our own protection, we realise it was not just to our ancestors that Jesus taught. And and it's not just to our ancestors that his apostles proclaimed. This is God's words to us who are alive today. He is the Messiah, Jesus, who has rescued you and set you free. So can you see how it's working? Paul picks up this question of cheap grace. Can we live as we want just because God is full of grace and love? Shall we go on sinning? I'm trying to find the... Shall we go on sinning? No. Don't you know that we died to sin? How can we live it in any longer? Are we still living in Egypt as slaves, the other side of the Red Sea? No. Don't you know that all of us who were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? Don't you know that your old life of slavery died in the waters of the Red Sea? We were buried through him in our baptism. Why? So that you might be free and set on a path to the promised land. So that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Can you see how the stories interweave. Baptism correlates with the Red Sea. Just as it correlates with the waters of Noah's flood, the old goes in and dies and the new comes out alive and they all correlate into the baptism that is the cross. Christ carries us in into the fathoming of death itself and he carries us out into the newness of promise on the other side. And can you see how these stories are not here for some theoretical point? In fact, if we can go back a little bit further into Paul's deep waters and pick up and one little part of the Exodus story in chapter 17, there is yet another time when the people quarrelled and whinged and that God had rescued them only to let them die of thirst. And in that moment, God empowers Moses to provide them with yet another miraculous, gracious outpouring of life-giving water. And then Moses called that place a name. He said, this will be called Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? That isn't theoretical or abstract. You know, there are times when I think we should rebrand the church of the Western world as the church of Massa and Meribah because we spend so much of our time quarrelling despising our freedom in Jesus and in our comfort we pontificate about a God that doesn't look like the God we like and in a cynical whinge we ask is he actually even here did the Red Sea even matter did my baptism count for anything at all does the cross have any value now we may not be crying out and grumbling for water But I tell you what, the last few months have tested us all and has raised the question. I was used to going to church. It was a comfortable routine, but now it's disrupted and everything has changed. And now I'm even wondering, is the Lord actually with us or not? Do I actually believe this or not? And it's a good to be honest with that question. But let's not play games with the answer. Because without honesty, where does it go? As soon as we posit 
that God may not actually be here in the room you're in with a real voice and a real heart, then we also, just like the Israelites, start to play the power games. And we don't form golden calves, but we form our philosophies and our frameworks and our worldviews and our spiritualities into a golden calf of our choice. And we even use the forms and aesthetics of Christianity to mould it. And we sometimes even call it Christ, reimagined the way we like. So Paul's exhortation is a deep-rooted one. Brothers and sisters, don't head down that path that path of cheap, cheap grace. Choose life, my friends. You have been baptised, my brothers and sisters. You have passed through the waters. You are his. You belong to Christ. You have been united with him in his death and are free from the power of sin and shame and all that held you captive as a people. Remember where you stand now. You're on the other shore. We have a unity with him in his resurrection. Your old self, your idolatry died with him. So we are no longer slaves to sin. Right now, our life is with him, guaranteed into eternity. He cannot die again. The mastery of death has gone. So now, in this moment... In the light of that eternal life, in this moment, right now, in your place where you are, with your voice and your hands, don't grumble and test the Lord and treat his rescue cheaply. Rather, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God. This isn't abstract. The consequences, the corollary, the implication is this. Do not let sin reign in your body. Do not offer your body, that's you, physically you, in this moment, in your place, with your voice and with your hands. Do not offer your body as instruments of wickedness. Rather, hear his call of freedom and offer yourselves to God as if you actually have been saved, redeemed, brought from death to life. Offer yourself as instruments of righteousness with lives that speak of reunion with God. Sin is not your master. You are not its slave. You live under grace now. Live in that freedom. Live for Jesus. With what you have, with where you are in this moment, with your voice, with your hands, even with your feet. And I could go on right now and I could talk about how for most Christians in this world, that living for freedom is a tangible, costly experience of discipleship. It is an intimate union with the Spirit of God. Each day is a new experience, a new conundrum, a new depth in our passion and purpose where we must come to God and say, teach me and show me and lead me. But we Westerners, we struggle. We like our cheap grace. And I could go on and I could talk about the obvious idols we struggle to leave behind, the money, sex and power, the misuse of career, the absolutization of sexuality, the misuse of people. But let's just hear this word from Paul, because I know I'd need to. Don't you know, brothers and sisters, that we died to such things? Don't you know that your hearts don't belong to those things anymore? Be free Whatever privilege you have, use it for good. It doesn't own you anymore. Be free. Whatever oppression or thirst or hunger or problem you may face, fear not. It isn't the last say in your life. Be free. Don't be captive to despair because of those things. The Lord is with you. But ultimately this. Brothers and sisters, in the name of Jesus, be free from the spirit of lies and unbelief. Be free from the hardening of heart and the sneering of faith. In the name of Jesus, be free from the power of the lie that says Jesus is not real and his word is not true. In the name of Jesus, be free. It was not just for your ancestors that the Lord reached out his hands and embraced the cross and made you his own. It was not just for Paul that he reimagined a new people of grace. It was not just for Rome that he imagined a church of disciples and a world moved by his life. The covenant he made in Jesus, he made with you and I who are alive today. Behold, Jesus of Nazareth, who was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, that we too may live new 
and different lives. Amen.